I had a, a really great opportunity to um, uh, my sister, I have a sister who lives in Texas and um, her and her husband, they vacation in, in North Lake Tahoe every, every summer and they took a couple days and came over and visited with us. And um, I get to any time I get to spend time with my brother-in-law Keith is always is always fun and encouraging. And um, we were talking about one of the things that got them to Texas more than 30 years ago was he kind of wanted to make his own way and start his own business. And and today he has an incredible business there. He has uh, a business that's grown that that his. Um, that his son, my nephew Austin, has worked his way into and worked from the bottom up and went to college and got uh, a master's in business, but has worked into the company from the bottom up and all the way to where Keith, at uh, dinner we were talking, and he says, you know, Austin runs this thing, right? I mean, he basically runs the whole thing. And um, it's a company that, that, that manufactures and builds large, steel buildings and um, large dairy buildings that are like acres large, right? Acres large. And, and then the funny thing was, he told me, he said, we're, he goes, we got approached by the government to build uh, three miles of the wall to supply materials for three miles of the wall. I'm like, what are you kidding me? Anyway, it was a fun conversation. Um, so I talked to, I said, you know, and Keith, I said, well, how's that going, Keith, to let go of running a company that you started and, and you built a suspense? He goes, he goes, he runs it completely different than I did. He goes, 180 degrees different than the way I did it and the way I, you know, got to where I was. I says, well, what, he goes, he goes, he goes, I never hung out with my employees, right? He goes, I never hung out. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't socialize with them. I didn't like, he goes, these guys, they hang out together. All their sales force hang out. You know, and he started talking about all this stuff. And then he said this, he said, but that's, that's, he said, I kind of had a military mindset. Really? You know, you had a task to do. You were accountable. If, it, if you were below somebody and it didn't get done, I went to the person above you and they got a talking to Right, he had this military, and you know, it worked. Obviously, the company was successful under this kind of, but he says today it's different. And, and he says, but I'll tell you what I did. He said, um, that came from when I was 22 years old, and I was working for my father, and who ran a su successful dairy equipment business in the San Joaquin Valley. My father pulled me aside and says, listen, you're gonna get in the car with this guy. And they called him the Colonel. He was the number one salesman, right? This was back in the, in, the, uh, in the early 80s. He was a top salesman for this company. And he said, you're gonna, he goes, whatever he, wherever he eats, you eat. Whenever he gets up, you get up. Whenever he goes to bed, you go to bed. You're gonna fall, so for a year, he uh, traveled all over the country with this guy they called the Colonel who was a top salesman and he said, he taught me everything I needed to know about how to sell, right? Right? And he says, and he was, he had spent time in the military, so part of that permeated into me and I ran my company with this kind of man's mindset. Yeah. So, why, why, why do I tell you that, 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 that story? Because it reminds me, it, it, it reminds me of, of this thing when we think about discipleship. Or we, we think about how it is and how we need to move and walk through the world. How do we navigate and it, discipleship, the following and, uh, of the rabbi, the teacher, the, you know, I look at Christ, I look at the life, of, and I shared this last week, I think in all the things that are going on around me, 
and I know that I want to, there's this tendency, I want to run to, I want to run to um, the eschatology, which is a big word for end time events and how things are going to work out. I want to run to that and I want to have all that clarified and I want to, I, I want to go to the end of the book and I want to read all the, ma- you know, I want to get all that figured out. Now, I'm not saying that's not what you should or couldn't do. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you, that's not going to bring you peace and bring you security in the moment to walk through and live the life that we need to live in this moment. That discipleship, you know, there was a, there was a saying that, uh, among rabbinical teachers of the time of Jesus. May the, dust, may the dust of your rabbi settle upon you. In other words, walk so closely to your rabbi, right? The teacher discipleship process that as he walks, you know, the dirt and the mud of the, of the sandals of your disciple that you would emulate and you would follow so closely. And the invitation is to be a disciple of the one. So when I when I think about the times that we live in, I just th- I can't I, 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 I'm running to this Jesus and I'm meeting him in so, so many extraordinary ways. And what is he teaching me? You know, and, and when you watch what Jesus does in the parables, right? When you watch what Jesus does in his interactions with other people, it's not Jesus does something so profound that in his interactions with others, he's teaching us how to interact with what? With others. How to live, how to walk, how to interact with those around us. So we, we looked at, at the story in Mark of the woman, right, of bleeding, who had bleeding, 12 years of bleeding and had done everything she could. And, and, and the story is told again in Luke. The eighth, the eighth chapter of Luke in uh, verse, verse 40 says this. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. A crowd, right? As Jesus, and, and, and then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came to, and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. Next verse. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him they almost crushed him i mean the the intensity of the crowds how many of you have ever been in a in a um in an intense crowd where you felt like you were going to be crushed and vince a van halen concert doesn't count though bro because that's you ever been up front no okay (laughs) right right where he almost lifts you off the ground anyway some of you're going what yeah it's an extraordinary but you, a, a crowd, right? I, you know, there's been a, there's been some interesting ca- crowds gathering, right? Um, gathering, crowds gathering for a uh, protest, for demonstration, right? And what's unfortunate is, is that those that, that under the banner of a demonstration. Even that crowd is hijacked by another crowd with another agenda. Are you are you, under, are you with me? Right? There is something that's intended, but then another crowd comes and there's this, the crowds tend to hijack things. We were at a concert one time in LA street scenes. I was in, I was a senior in high school, LA street scenes. And uh, we went to this concert. We saw Oingo Boingo in concert, right? So, okay. Now, they 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 played a short set and this is outdoor amphitheater and there's probably about seven eight thousand people there and we're waiting for the next band to come on but the next band didn't come on well the crowd started to get restless and then after a little while they had uh the the police came in and on a loudspeaker said you need to leave the uh, you need to leave the area you need to exit the area now this is all downtown la right and well, i'm like okay we're gonna leave now well there were people that didn't want to leave and and those people that didn't want to leave started a little bit of a chant that got the rest of the crowd to catch on till about eight nine thousand people are chanting you know no we won't go or so i don't know what and what was what was crazy 
Then they started to move down the streets and a full on riot broke out. I mean, I'm just, it was unbelievable how quickly this wave of a crowd mentality can shift. Um, we're, well, I'm, I was in kind of a, we didn't have cell phones back then that could re record stuff. Thank goodness, hey amen. Some of you are going, I'm so glad, man, when I grew up, we didn't. Anyway, um, the crowd mentality, right? Says this, he says, there was a crowd almost crushed him and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. No one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. Jesus, we talked about, you know, he had this keen awareness. He says, who touched me? Who touched me? And Jesus asked, and when they did, when they all denied it, Oh, this is so interesting. Who touched me, right? What do you mean all? The entire crowd that was pushing around, you know, I didn't touch you, I didn't, you know, right? Uh, Jesus asked, when, all, when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. There's a crowd around you. In, in one episode of The Chosen, where the first crowd, there's a, Jesus began to attract crowds, Right? And what's interesting is that in one of the episodes where a crowd begins to gather and Jesus is at a house teaching that his, his ragtag of coming together disciples that are just entering into this new rabbi-disciple relationship look around and go, whoa, hey, whoa, he's attracting crowds. Like, whoa, something's happening here. Jesus has an interesting relationship with crowds, right? If, 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 in John, the sixth chapter of John, we find that Jesus, in a gathering of a crowd, he has just fed this large crowd. He just fed them, right? Crowds like, and he, he provides all this food, and then he um, gets in a boat, chapter six, and they go out on the water, and then there's the whole moment where, you know, that moment where Jesus walks on water. Okay. All right? He's fed a crowd. He comes out on the boat with his disciples. He walks on water, and then he comes back to the beach. In, in John 6, if you have your Bibles, John 6, the 25th, the funny, 25th uh, verse of chapter 6, says this. John says, When... They found him on the other side of the lake. Who found him? The crowd. The crowd found him, right? When they found him, they asked him, Rabbi, where did you, how, uh, when did you get here? Right? When did you get here? The crowd, the crowd's like, you know, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, verse 26, Very truly I tell you, Are you are looking for me not because you saw saw the signs I performed, okay? But because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Oh, Jesus is saying, listen, you you seek me, you found me, you're part of the crowd, and you continue to be part of the crowd because you got some need met. You got some some physical need met, right? You got food, you got fed. And, and it's important to understand that, you know, the crowd at that time, when he performed that miraculous deed of supplying food for the many, they are looking at it like, whoa, wait a second. You know those times when we're in great need? You got to remember those economies and the, uh, the, the agricultural economy and it's all based in food was of the absolute you and i can just go down to a supermarket and these kinds of things for them this is profound here is somebody who can provide the most basic need the most urgent need of our lives is sustenance physical food right now okay he can provide that that is a huge advantage 
If we're in and around that, that is a huge advantage, right? You begin to see this. Jesus is addressing a thing that is profound. You know, when Jesus enters into the city, there is cheering that happens. Hosanna, Hosanna. The crowd cheers. Hosanna, Hosanna. Because part of what motivates that crowd is there is they're seeing the opportunity for political transformation and gain that can transform can bring them into a new political power and strength are you are you seeing this for a or do you see that right there's the crowd has these needs and they're looking at the one that they're crowding around as the one who can meet these whether it's political needs whether it's uh um you know uh physical needs of food resources oh he has the corner on the resource market. We know in a, in a world economy, whoever has the food has the power. Whoever has the political strength has the power. Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. The crowd responds. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the work God requires? What are they still focused on? What are they still, what do they work, what are they focused What do we got to do? What did he just tell them? Long for the food that I will, that's eternal, that I will freely give you. That is gracefully given to you in abundance, right? And their next question is, what do we got to do to do the works of God? I mean, little do they know that all the redeemable work of God is standing right before them in the person of Jesus. Amen. That all that they need, all the works and everything is right there in the person of Jesus. Jesus is the grace, mercy, and abundant love of God. Right there in their midst. What do we got to do to do the works that are required? Uh, it's, it's hard to make a mind. It's hard to to make a shift from a, 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 a task-oriented, of a works-oriented culture, isn't it? You know, if, if, you, if you've grown up in a, in, a, in a strict, religious, you know, fundamental uh, family environment, it is difficult. It is difficult sometimes to transition into the free grace an abundance that God gives, isn't it? Because Jesus answered. Ready? Here's the work you got to do. This is all the work. You ready? It's going to get, shake it off, get loose, because here it goes. He says, Jesus answered. The work of God is this. To believe in the one he has sent. But Jesus said in Luke, the 8th chapter, verse 46, you turn your Bibles and there's a crowd, Jesus. They're all, this is a crowd. Everybody's pressing in on you. But Jesus said, I mean, there's a crowd, Jesus, there's, there's a crowd, there's a crowd that wants you to, you know, to get, get them the stuff. Jesus said, someone touched me, and I know that power has gone out from me. 
Now don't miss, this is, this, why does Jesus, why does he do this? Why does he press into this? I, I, why does he press into this? Why is he going to do this to this woman? Because he's not going to let it go. He's not going to let it go. You know, because I think he knows. I mean, he's, he's, call, he's calling out, someone's touched me. Come on. And I think in his heart of hearts, he's all, he's all please. You know, I can't, I can't wait for my sister to come forward. I can't wait uh, just to affirm her. And why does he need to call her out? He needs to call her out for you and me, the crowd. He wants to teach in this moment. You remember? Follow the rabbi, what he does, where, when he rises, when he sleeps, what he eats, what his rhythms are. Find out what it is and do that. More than that, know him personally. Watch the interactions of Jesus. Because he, keeps, he continues to lean in and call this woman out. Because more important, he knows she's good. He knows, he knows she's good. He wants to teach the crowd, the woman, then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed. She could have gone unnoticed by everybody else, but who? Jesus. And think about that for a moment. She could have ran. But what happens in simple belief, right? What happens in that simple enough that you believe in the one, that if you believe just enough, that the touch will be enough, right? That that enough is, becomes not enough. Because she comes back to him and she says, uh, she came trembling and fell at his feet. She came trembling and fell at his feet. She was in fear because she thought, she knew she had been healed in that moment. And there's a part of her, remember that old kind of thinking? What, what is required? What is, what, what is required? What works are required, right? For her, a person who was afflicted with this condition, it was considered in that culture, in that religion, a mark of some sin in her life, of something wrong with her. And no amount of offerings, no amount of sacrifices could redeem it. Twelve years, she continued to be in this condition. It's a hard mind shift. She comes back, she's fearful because she thinks she might lose it. If he really knows me, he won't accept what he did. In the presence of the people, she, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. You know, Jesus wants, he knows it's uncomfortable for her. I mean, she, she came fearful, right? She knows it's, un, he knows that it's uncomfortable for her to come out and voice this in the crowd because it is the crowd that has been what? They know her story. Now she has to just fully undress her entire story to the crowd that has always already been what? Casting judgment, critical. critical, unaccepting, marginalized. It's the crowd that marginalizes and that crowd think, right? And, 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 and Jesus pulls her out in this moment because he wants to rewrite. He wants to give. Oh, I love this. He wants the crowd to get a glimpse at the heart of God. You know, I mean, what do you think she's waiting for? What do you think she's waiting for? 
the religion that she had around her, what do you think she's waiting for from Jesus? Acceptance. Acceptance. Do you think that she's, she, I mean, she's fearfully trembling. She wants, she wants all these things, but she's, she's got, oh, he's going to, he's going to tell me, you know what? You're right. And she probably in her subconscious mind is going, I'm not worthy of the healing that's taken part in my body. If he knows me, he'll know I'm not worthy of it. And, but Jesus I mean, I can't imagine all that was going through her mind in that moment. But Jesus wanted to hear, he knows her story. And he listens. And he, I think Jesus is hoping that the crowd is listening. Because in his response, he's going to share and expose the heart of God for all people who are broken. Daughter, your faith has healed you. And then he and then he says, he says, this is just so. He says, you know, like that's enough, right? No, he says this. He says, go in peace. Your faith has healed you. No, go, go in peace because you, you know. Don't be fearful any longer of the heart of God. Don't be afraid of what you've been given in abundance. Don't fear that grace will be ripped from your hands. Right? I mean, look at all that's going on in this teachable moment. And he's hoping that the crowd is watching, right? And they're listening. This is a lesson for the crowd. Where, where I, you know, I read these, Jesus is just trying to teach us so much in his interactions and how he's, and I don't know where you find yourself in the story, right? You know how we put ourselves in the story? And I always, my first inclination is to put myself in as the good guy, right? Which is really not where it needs to go, but. You know, I ask myself, what part of crowd mentality am I living out in my life? Many are pressed upon you today, Jesus. Many have touched you. And I think under his breath, he could have said, and they have no idea what they've come in contact with or it would have changed them indefinitely. That's it. Are, you, are we there? I mean, encounter him. You want to talk about 4th of July and freedom? We have incredible freedoms in this country. But the freedom that will only bring humanitarian, human restoration and reclamation is the saving life of Christ. That the crowd be transformed. That the crowd be healed. That the crowd comes in contact with the one, touches and realizes what they're up against or what they've come in contact with is not someone who simply, like he said, you want food, man, that's an easy thing to do. What you really need is food that, that's eternal, that'll feed your soul, that'll heal you in ways that'll, that'll transform your life today and for eternity. It's a great, isn't it? It's a great story. Oh, you just... This Jesus. This Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father God, um, may we not, may we press in into your presence and be changed. 
May we move from being just a part of the crowd to being in personal contact with you. Knowing that the divine grace has been poured over our lives and that peace is abundant, available to us in abundance. We pray that in your name. Amen. Amen. Oh, my good people. Um, blessings. Happy Sabbath. Continue to practice safe, those kinds of things. And uh, God is good. God is good. Uh, prayer requests, needs, again, just uh, contact me. The chosen books are available. Again, we'll be in our virtual Zoom meeting. Make sure that you're on the email list. Please tell me if you're not getting weekly emails and bulletins and updates and links to these things so that we can make sure that you're connected. God's grace. Shabbat shalom. Blessings. <laughs>